is August 18th uh, in 2015. I was at my unit um, at Moffett Field, which is in Mountain View, California, in the Silicon Valley. And uh, it was like a 56-year-old man was on this ship called the Green Ridge. I sent you that picture. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's this huge ship uh, that transports vehicles. I think it sits about 200 or 400 feet off the water line. So it's like a skyscraper moving through the water. And yeah. uh, it's, it's crazy. Board. It's a huge ship. I'll post a picture on social media if you, for those who want to take a look at it, but it's a giant it's ship. It's shocking to see this ship and then our little Zodiac next to it. But uh, Well, when you said that, because it wasn't on the picture, but you said, yeah, we're the, or maybe it was on the picture, but you said we're the little dot in the Zodiac next to the ship. And I was like, that's when I, the, it, the full, you know, gravity of the, the size of the ship kind of hit me, you know, I'm like, what? This is amazing. It's crazy. Wild. So it's 10 o'clock, right? Basically it's like 10 o'clock on a Wednesday, I think, or something like that. And everyone's doing their normal stuff. I think we just got done with PT and everyone's back in uniform. We have different trainings we're going to do. And what would happen is the coast guard would basically call our operations center and say, we had a mission drop. And so I was getting ready to go someplace, but I got to put a text out on our cell phones. Everyone gets to the mission room. We got a mission drop. And so we come to the mission room, uh, which that was another thing I got to see. Like you just said, I got to see the unit back in the nineties and then the unit now in 2000 when it's guardian angel. And we had our, before we had a building that we had made into our unit. Now the, the state of California had built us a guardian angel, guardian angel building. So nice. it was, it's insane. It has a gym. It has a special place for the riggers to do all the parachute stuff and a huge tower to hang and dry the parachutes, have a team of life support people that take care of all our radios and MBGs and, a person who just takes care of like uh, all of our helmets. I mean, it's, it's just, it's insane. And it's all in one building. There's an armory. We have our own armory. Uh, so we have a guy who's assigned to us all our weapons. We have our own mechanic, small engine mechanic who takes care of all of our vehicles. And it's, nice. it's an amazing machine. <laughs> Anybody yeah, who's yeah. worried about the military getting soft in any way is, does not have to worry. It's an amazing machine. It's amazing. Yeah. I got to be a part of it. it was, so this mission drops, we meet in the mission room and we see that, you know, picture of the green Ridge that the guy had grabbed off the internet. Uh, Cause that's another thing right now you could go on the internet and put in green Ridge and you can see where this ship is oh, okay. in the world. It's pretty wild. Um, <laughs> and uh, it was a 56 year old man and he's coughing up blood. Uh, we think for three days and he's in and out of consciousness. And that's what, that's what we get. So right away we, we get a, a mission breakdown and I see that I'm going to be on the jump team and that I'm going to be the medic and that it's a thousand miles out in the ocean oh. is where this ship is. And the ship is going to turn around and maybe start heading back towards uh, America because it was, it was part of this training uh, mission where it picked up some equipment at Camp Pendleton and now it was on its way to Hawaii and then it was going to go to Korea. Oh, okay. like to test how long it would take us to get equipment from Pendleton to Korea if there was a conflict. That's what we were told. Gotcha. Um, and so this was one of the engineers on board the ship who was having a medical issue. And so now the Coast Guard can respond to things that are about 150 miles off of the coast, but they don't have any kind of capability to refuel their, their aircraft, at least not at that time. I don't think they still do. Uh, and so because... Uh, the California National Guard has helicopters that have that stinger on the front of it. The Blackhawks with the stinger it can refuel in the air. You know, the, the crews can fly a long time. So that's why we're right. called a lot, these kind of missions. So we get our med, we have all our gear already ready to go. Like everything is set up on these shelves for different types of missions. And so we just start grabbing our gear off the shelves and checking it you know, checking, checking the transponders to make sure that if something really goes wrong, we can be found checking our radios. I'm going through the medical gear, checking everything, even though I know it's all perfect. Cause it was, we check it all the time. It's got to do it again, just to say we did it. Sure. Sure. And uh, we got some, um, packed red blood cells 
from a local hospital and uh, we jumped on an aircraft and we started flying, you know, the five hour flight, a uh, thousand miles out in the ocean. Man. Yeah. So you're on a, you're on a helo going out there. So no, we're flying, we fly out on a, it was kind of confusing. We fly out on a C-130 cause it's faster. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then usually what happens is then they also start getting the helicopters ready. Um, cause we'll fly out and jump in and get the patient, um, uh, ready to go to what, however, we're going to take them somewhere. This, this mission, what they were going to do was they were going to send an aircraft carrier from, uh, San Diego out and then send a destroyer out. The destroyer can move faster than the aircraft carrier, but the aircraft carrier has, uh, you know, a hospital on it. You're right. Okay. And so we were going to fly out. Uh, we got out on station and it was it was wild. It was like 40 knot winds with uh, the ocean, uh, 10 to 15 foot swells. Uh, it was like a storm coming. Oh my God. And so uh, I'm I, you know, on the way out, you know, I'm, I'm texting and calling my wife or my, she's my girlfriend at the time saying, Hey, you know, it's hard not to get a little emotional now, but I'm just like, Hey babe, I'm going out on this mission, man. And I uh, uh, hope everything goes cool. And I'll see you soon. And I, I, I think she was in a yoga class. And so I kept, she teaches yoga. So I kept uh, texting her and calling her until I think the, the privacy, you know, the do not disturb, I think I broke it. And so finally she picked up the phone <laughs> and came in and now to do a mission, you know? So, uh, yeah, we flew out there and then we, you know, we get on station and we check in with the, the, um, the, uh, the ship captain, Hey, you know, here we are flying around the ship what's the status of the guy. And we got, you know, that he's still in and out of consciousness and he's got, you know, vitals that were decent. So we're like, all right, you know, uh, the team leader does his, uh, what his ORM, right. Operational risk management. And it's like, Hey, yep. this is a good mission. Let's go. And so we got our Rams package. We, we load up all of our equipment in these, uh, waterproof bags. Um, I don't know how you did it, but it, it for our team, we always chest mounted our equipment which is different than throwing it between your legs. Yeah. We, yeah, we never, we just did between the legs. Yeah. But so our team, for whatever reason was all about the chest mount. <laughs> uh, what we were told was that if something goes wrong, uh, you can do your safety operations and you won't get into some sort of weird body position where if you have that ruck between your legs and you go to bring your hands down to do your emergency procedures, you could get into some sort of weird spin. We had guys. For sure, yeah. Really into yeah. So just so they didn't have any trouble getting to your handles or anything or your, your cutaway pillow or anything or. Yeah. It's all, they had a dial dude. That yeah. Yeah. So cool. I'm sure they did. So I've got a shit ton of equipment on man. And like <laughs> side story yeah. real quick. Um, I had, uh, I'd been in a motorcycle accident when I came back from Afghanistan, I was out riding my motorcycle. Uh, I was told that it's kind of normal for guys to have incidents like this. Cause when you come back from combat, you're, your risk assessment meter is all screwed up. And yeah. so it was perfectly normal for me to jump on my Ducati and cruise around the Santa Cruz mountains really fast. Like it's, I felt calm when I was doing that. Uh, but I ended up crashing and broke my collarbone. And so my collarbone oh. had this plate on it, uh, with eight screws, this titanium plate. And when I went to put all the gear on, I'd never, I had jumped and stuff, but I never jumped with that much gear and dude, the the weight on that plate was like bringing tears to my eyes it hurt so bad oh no and i was like all right dude you know we're gonna do this uh mission i was like fuck i'd stand up and i'd sit down i'd stand up and i'd sit down i'm like <laughs> well i'll just wait until we're supposed to jump and then i can stand up and i can grit it until i just get out of the plane <laughs> and uh, we got out Man. we threw out the package like we're supposed to and the way it works is like you throw out the package you see the two parachutes are good and now you're going to go out and it's a static line square um, our concern was because the winds were so high, uh, this, the, uh, the package has an FXC that's on it. And this FXC is this device that when the package hits the water and there's that split second delay, it can detach the parachutes will detach from the package. And now the package will float in the water and it won't get dragged across the water at whatever the wind speeds are. Oh, okay. But it's only rated, it's only rated to like, I want to say like 28 knots or something like that. And there oh. was 40 knot winds. And so we were concerned, Hey, we're going to come out. 
we're going to go to half breaks right away and watch the package. And when it hits the water and it detaches, we're cool. If it doesn't, everyone's set up because what you do is now people have to take turns dive bombing that package and try to land on top of it so you can cut the parachutes off. Oh, so, okay. Yeah. Jeez. So, <laughs> God almighty. Yeah. And then we're like, okay, so the winds are so high that when you hit the water, just as you're hitting the water, detach the, the rings um, so that you can uh, cut away your parachute and it won't deploy your um, reserve, right? I forget what those rings are. But those yeah, I know what you're talking about, like, though. Yeah, there's like once, once you pull your cutaway handle, it's supposed to deploy the other one. But if you detach something, right, it'll cut it. It'll it won't cut. It won't deploy that reserve automatically. Yeah. Have you ever had a cutaway? When I you never have. Jumping? Not never, 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 not once. So I had, I had a couple one. close calls where I had like a bag lock or I had like a, you know, some twists or something, but I've, I've always just kind of like wrote it out. You know, I've never, never cut away. Go what about through, you? You ever had one? Yes. Yeah. So I was going through training. Okay. No. Uh, I was re retrained. Right. And we're out at uh, Roswell because there's this cool drop zone out there at Roswell and it's a night jump, full moon, beautiful, full equipment jump. Uh, and I jump out and I'm having a great jump. And I go to pull and I get a bag lock. Oh, no, no. I got a line over. I got a line over. So everything okay. comes out and I'm looking up and I'm, I'm slowing down, but there's a really like a lot of noise. Yeah. yeah. And it's like the canopy like shaking. And so right, yeah. I, uh, I, I think the next safety procedure you're supposed to do is pull on the brakes and try to, you know, deploy the, deploy the brakes. And then maybe that'll open up the parachute, but I guess it yeah, yeah. caused the line over to get worse. Oh, no. I started going this gnarly spin, dude, like gnarly, so hard that like I could see space in between my shoulder harness and my body because I was turning so hard and it was stretching the harness oh. and I just, I didn't let it go more than a couple seconds and I did the cutaway. Yeah. It was so fast. I was so impressed with how fast the reserve parachute came out. Oh, really? Yeah. And it was like cut away, boom! I had another parachute right on top of me, and then I just it was it was a little faster, so it was a little little sketchier when I came down to land because I just remembered like it was I think it's a little bit smaller of a canopy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, that was my cutaway story. So back to the you know thousand miles out in the ocean, we get out there, we get all our stuff going. The package hits the water, the package deploys, the the parachutes come off. I turn on final to go downwind or sorry, upwind. So I can slow down a little bit. Yeah. I, uh, I do the cutaway like I'm supposed to just as my fins, I can feel my fins and hear the water on my fins and the package, uh, between my legs came up and hit me in the chin and knocked me out. Oh my goodness. Yeah, dude. Yeah. Did you have like a like an LPU or something or some sort of life preserver or anything? I think because I had so much equipment on and we jump in in dry suits. Yeah. That I, I I believe I just stayed straight up and down. I don't know how long I was unconscious, but like the waves or the water woke me up. Oh my and, gosh. Uh, yeah, dude. And I remember I just like checked my body over real quick. Like, hey, I'm I'm not bleeding anywhere. I'm good. I kind of felt this like little sting in my back, but you know, whatever. Right. Yeah, you know, yeah. There's always something when you're jumping or doing shit. And so I just went through everything. I, I detached my equipment and had like a leader line on it. So that's far enough away from me that I can swim. And so I started swimming my way back to the package and there, you know, there's these huge swells. I could see my guys and then I'd go down the bottom of the swell and I'd keep swimming. And it felt like I swim for maybe, you know, 45 minutes or so. And 45 back, minutes. It was, it was forever, more. dude. I and you're not like, it, and you know, for guys like me who don't really go out in the ocean, let alone, or don't really, you know, I don't live by the ocean, but you weren't just off the beach. I mean, you're like a thousand, a thousand miles, miles out. You're in the middle of the ocean. I mean, it's like, this is, oh my God. It's wild. Cause I've, I've had two missions like this. Uh, I, my first one was like in the, in the 1996 or seven. And it was, it was nothing like this mission. And it was mellow, but still, I remember, you know, you fly in the plane out from San Francisco and you're kind of flying in the shipping lane. So you can look down and see big ships. And so you're like, all right, cool. If something goes wrong. One of these big ships is going to go by and see us. But then at a certain point you turn right. off of that and you start going in a different direction. And then you're like, oh dude, I'm part of the food chain now, man. If something goes wrong, 
We're going to be out here for <laughs> no a long doubt. time. Yeah. And you do oh, jump. Oh, my goodness. You jump like a little butt boat. So you jump this little boat that you have, you know, it just sits back up by your butt that if something goes wrong, you can deploy that and get inside of it. But it's just oh, okay. Mean, nothing like a one man raft or something. Yeah. 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 So, you know, I wake up, I get, I get, I'm good. I'm not bleeding anywhere. I, I, I take my leader line. I get my thing. I start swimming. I get back to the package and the package had floated back into the parachute. So it's all wrapped up with all these lines and shit. And so we're trying to clear it all. We get it all dialed. We get it open. We get the raft inflated. We get all our equipment in it. And then we're trying to get this thing started. And it's, it's kind of a, a weak spot in the operation all the time is that if the, the fuel can be new and if you don't change out the hose that goes from the fuel to the engine, if any of that fuel in there has been sitting too long and it starts separating, it puts all those particles into the carburetor and the engine won't start. And uh-huh. so it happens all the fucking time. And we got it started right away. And we're all like, yeah, yeah. we're fucking rock stars. <laughs> and then the junk got stuck in there. And then for the next 45 minutes, we're all taking turns trying to get this thing started as these oh huge waves are coming by. And one of my partners, uh, Jacob, he had the, the, they had paddles in there and he's trying to keep us facing into the waves as they're coming towards us, these huge waves. We get everything started. Finally, we motor over to the ship. And like I say, that picture, dude, you get next to that ship and you're like, Holy fucking shit, dude. Yeah. That, like you said, it's like a yeah. it's like a skyscraper. It's like a building that you're next to. Wait, so when you were in the water uh, doing all this stuff, like you were knocked out, you swimming over, you could, you could see the boat. It was like in the near vicinity to you. Okay. All right. I was like, was I was just thinking, man. Yeah. What, what would happen if what you guys were, if you lost sight of it? Or I mean, do you have, I mean, navigation yeah. equipment that you could get to it or? Probably, but it stays right there because they want us to come help. Oh, sure, that. sure. <laughs> yeah. So they stay right there, and, and the, but the sea state was so bad that they weren't going to deploy one of their longboats, which is always always like kind of like what? So the sea state's so bad that you won't deploy one of your boats, but you're cool with us going through all this shit to yeah. deploy one of our own boats to get over next to you, right? But that's just how it goes, right? Like yeah. in, my, in my job in pararescue, they don't call you when shit's cool; they call you when shit's all fucked up. So right. We got over there next to the ship. What we, we radioed to the ship and asked them to turn into the wind. So they turned the ship sideways into the wind and to cut power, at least cut power long enough for us to get onto the ship. And so yeah. now we get over next to the ship and the way it works is they drop a painter's line. So they drop a, a rope along the length of the ship. I, I don't know how many feet, but a long part of the ship. And then we motor up next to it. We grab the painter's line. And then we keep our engine going and we keep our raft like at an angle and we get up next to, there's a cutout about 150 to 250 feet up on the ship. There's a cutout and they drop a rope ladder and then we can climb up the rope ladder. And then they sent a hoist over and grabbed our gear off of the raft and hoist up all of our gear onto the ship. And then we're going to get next to the um, ladder, the rope ladder, and then climb up. And our engine died. Oh no. And our engine died some weird vortex of water, something happened and the whole raft tacoed and kind of held us in place and suck and started getting sucked under the ship. Oh my God. We bounced up next to the ship and the whole thing starts to taco and we start to kind of go under the ship. So you're in the boat when it taco. Oh, geez. How many, how many guys are in there? Four. There's four of us. There's there's three PJs and a combat rescue officer. Oh my and God. so it it didn't seem like a long time, but something happened and it buoyancy worked or you know, one of those Boyle's law or something kicked into place and we boom, we pop back up next to the side of the ship and the raft's open and I'm right next to the motor with the team leader. I'm pulling on the handle trying to get this thing started as fast as possible. We get it started. We go out, we do a victory lap. We kind of reassess what we're doing. <laughs> and then... Thank God uh, you're alive. You right? <laughs> and it's like, well, we got we to get out of the ship. Let's go back. So we go back to do it again. We get everything in place like we're supposed to. We're motoring up next to the ladder. And the engine dies again. And this time when it died, we got sucked along the whole side of the ship. And it seemed like it happened so fast. And there was the reaction. I don't know what else we could have done, but there's that 
part that sticks out from the ship where the cars can drive up onto the ship. Yeah. And the the way the waves are going, I guess it went down, the wave went down and we went down under that and we started to go behind the back of the ship and we're all of us are staring at the screw of the ship turning. And Jeez. I start scrambling. So I'm like pulling on the bottom of the ship. I don't know what I'm doing, dude, but I'm pushing or something. I mean, the, the guy said that somehow I, I pushed us out from underneath the ship. Oh, my God. And I got pictures of it because the pilots thought these guys are going to perish. So let's take pictures of, of them <laughs> doing the rescue. And I didn't send you that picture because I was like, this guy doesn't want to see all these fun pictures. But I got a picture of us when we came out from behind the boat. No, I'll take ship. that one for sure. I'd love to see yeah. that one. It's some crazy, dude. And, oh. and uh, we learned later that you can ask them to cut power, but it takes 15 minutes for the screw to stop turning. So I don't know if you ever wait 15 minutes, but I don't know. That's just something we learned. So <laughs> yeah, we, I mean. We got out behind it again. We got it started, you know, again. And then we were like, what the fuck, dude? We we're all just kind of looking <laughs> at each other like, well, we got to get on this ship, dude. That's yeah. what we're here to do. And I remember at one point, one of these huge waves goes by. Once we get out from like behind the ship, now we're exposed to the big waves and this big wave goes by and we're trying to motor up the wave on our little Zodiac. We can't get to the top of it. So then we turn and come down and like surf the wave down and then we get out around Jeez. the wave. And it's been wild. Like, and it's, it's an adrenaline rush. So it's like, um, when I think about it now, I can kind of get like sweaty and my body like reacts to it, like with this fear. But at the time it's like, you're living life to the fullest, man. Yeah. I wouldn't and plus, Well, not only that, but like it's survival mode at that point, you don't have time to freak out and, you know, be like, Oh my goodness, this sucks. It's like, no, I got to do something now or it will suck. Or we're going to be dead. Oh my right. God. And so plus like, what else are you guys going to do? You're, you're in a little Zodiac in the middle of the ocean. I mean, it's like, you can be like, ah, we're just going to blow off this rescue. It's like, where are you going to go <laughs> oh, now? Dude. You just got to yeah. get on the, this is your way out anyway. Oh my God. Yeah. And so we finally get over next to this ship, dude. And, uh, we get, get everything works. Finally, we get to the rope ladder <laughs> and one of my buddies goes up and he's like, all right, Scardino, it's your turn. And you know, from my firefighter training, dude, I'm like skipping rungs. I'm running up this ladder. And I remember <laughs> the guy on the ship was like, now that's how you climb a fucking ladder. <laughs> like, I'm just like, shoo, 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 like a monkey, dude. Like I was up that sucker like that, you know, but then you're like, okay, I need to have all my gear with me ready. Cause what happens if one of the guys falls in the water or something? So you're still in this mode. We find, once we finally got on the ship, then you kind of was like, all right, whew, okay, cool. All right, we're good. Dude. Then I get in to see my patient and Wait, hold on. So what do you do with the boat when it's on the side of the boat? What do you do with your Zodiac? They they grabbed a gun. Like they have a, a pistol in the in the ship's inventory, like in a safe. And they came and, and they shot holes in the raft and it just sunk it. Oh, okay, okay. So yeah. you just write that off. It was, it's like you're not getting that back. Yeah, they didn't okay. have a way to bring the raft up onto the ship. And so I think they just wrote it off. Yeah. Okay. All right. So then, you know, we get all of our equipment and we're like, all right, cool. We're here to treat this guy. And I walked in and saw my patient for the first time. And I knew from all my paramedic calls, his skins were all gray. Like the, just the look of them. I was like, oh, fuck, dude. Like, we're not going to be able to save this guy. Oh, no. Yeah. And so I was on a sat phone and my partner, Jacob, and I, we worked on this guy for 10 hours. Like we took shifts, but we worked on him for 10 hours. We, we used every single drug. We used our everything. And we ran out of oxygen. We jumped in oxygen bottles too. And, um, they had oxygen on the ship. And once we used all of our oxygen, um, his O2, cause we bring in like a, we bring in a mobile hospital, bro. It's pretty impressive. Like we jumped in like defibrillator monitoring equipment that can monitor, uh, blood pressure, O2 sat, uh, blood gases. Once you intubate the person, uh, we had a ventilation machine, like we had all kinds of stuff, man. We had, like I told you, I had packed red blood cells and a machine that can heat the blood so it can go into the person at the right temperature. And we started oh doing all that. Like we jumped on this guy. We got IVs started. We got blood going into him. We're giving him uh, epinephrine to see if maybe we can jumpstart his heart so that he'll start breathing on his own. And and maybe his O2 sat will go up. And he, we we're trying everything, dude. But Man. After 10 hours of using everything, we basically ran out of medical equipment and he went to a code. He, he went to full arrest.
test. And uh, we did a, we did all those procedures too, but at a certain point we we're getting a hold of the doctor on the aircraft carrier. And we're like, Hey, we got this guy and he's in full arrest and we've done everything we can for him. So we want to basically what you say is you're, you're going to call him, but you need a doctor's permission to do that. And there's certain uh -huh. parameters you're supposed to check to make sure that, you know, Hey, maybe his blood sugar is low. And if we give him blood sugar, maybe that'll help. And he'll come, you know, yeah, and it, it, you, the last thing you want to do is call it prematurely. I mean, you're like you're they're there to save the guy anyway. So yeah, of course. Yeah. Man, I'm sorry to hear that 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 guy didn't make it. Yeah, Did you ever yeah. find out what the deal was? Like, what what was his, what happened to him? Nobody knows. What we, were, what we were told was that he had a similar episode where he was coughing up blood and he was in port, and so he went to the doctor right away and got treated. And this was his first trip back, uh, where he was cleared to be on a ship. And I, you know, he probably, he looked like the classic, I don't know, but he looked like the classic person who's drank his whole life. And he, there's this thing called like varices, which I'm not up in my medical terminology, but basically the arteries, uh, and the veins around his heart, they get weakened. And I think the aorta is the place where it's the most prevalent because there's so much pressure there and the walls get weakened by the alcohol, uh, and they'll burst. Uh, okay. And so he had maybe a rupture somewhere else or somewhere close and he got that fixed, but then back on the ship under the same conditions. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. And, and, so, and the guy just might've not been healthy in the first place. I mean, you know, who knows? Well, there's no, yeah, because of HIPAA laws now, like you used to be able to get this kind of information so you could learn from it. But now, man, because of uh protection of people's rights and stuff, you never learn. Even when you take people to the hospital now as a paramedic, you used to get like, hey, what happened? So you could learn from it and maybe have a better treatment schedule next time, but you never learn now. So Wow, it's crazy. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. Yeah, so then it turned into, okay, extraction. How are we going to get off this ship? And so that's where it's super valuable to have a combat rescue officer that knows all the ins and outs. And he got the helicopter from the aircraft carrier to come it had to fly and then refuel on a destroyer. It, so it landed on the back of the destroyer, refuels, and then it came and it got on station with us and it sent down the, it's a, it's a Seahawk. So it's a, I think it's a, it's a Black Hawk, but it's an outfit. I think it's a little smaller, but it's, it's outfitted yeah. for the ocean. So it's Seahawk. And so it sent down its hoist. We got on the helicopter and we flew to the destroyer. Uh, we landed, it refueled. They gave us some hot chow, which was awesome. And then, uh, no doubt. We flew Right. Oh, you guys had to be exhausted, man. I just, you just, I mean, oh, oh, I can't imagine like oh, going, yeah. like just a five hour flight, then jumping in, getting knocked unconscious, then swimming to the, the package, putting that together. Then the whole, you know, the whole fiasco of, you know, almost dying a couple times and then 10 hours of, you know, treatment, dude. Oh my gosh, man. Nobody it, gets it, dude. And there's yeah, guys I, right now doing this mission, bro. Like they get missions all the time at Moffett Field and nobody ever hears about it. Dang. It's amazing. And so um, we got on, so then we get on the helicopter, they land, and then we go to the aircraft carrier. And that was rad, dude. Flying <laughs> up on an aircraft carrier, you're like, holy shit, this is a floating city. Yeah. And we got there, we landed, and then guys came out and grabbed our stuff and walked us in. And they're like, the Admiral wants to meet you, man, right away because it's like, he's never met anyone or a team of guys that are trained to go a thousand miles out in the ocean to save someone. And he's like, he wants to shake your hand. So we got led all through this ship, which was incredible, man. It's so clean, so pristine. Each bulkhead is shined to perfection. This ship was immaculate, man. It's, it's impressive. Yeah. And then you get to where the Admiral's quarters are and everything's like, you know, cherry wood and just beautiful. And he's got a whole, you know, I think I'm a captain, I think is who's in charge of like at his beck and call. So we roll in and the captain's like at attention. He's like, all right, you know, the Admiral wants to meet you and went in and he shook, a, shook our hands and talked to us for a while. And then uh, we went to where the helicopters live because since they came and got us, like that's where we're supposed to hang out. And then I guess at one point the jet pilots came down to say hello to us and the helicopter pilots were all impressed because like, oh, the jet pilots don't talk to us because we're, not considered as cool as right. they are. Right, so right. It's like, you want to meet PJs because you were the guys who could potentially come save us if something goes wrong. And then at a certain point, it was decided, okay, cool, we're going to get another aircraft, which was called like a COD, but 
it's basically one of those aircrafts you see that the Navy has that they'll put like a dish on so they can detect submarines. It's a small double prop, you know, single prop, like double prop plane engine on each in, on each wing. I got you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And so now we're going to get catapulted off of the aircraft carrier, bro. Oh my God. Dude, it was insane. <laughs> so they don't, and, but no one tells you, right? So they get all your equipment. We stick it in the middle of the plane, which is cool. Like you, you fly and sit on the back of the plane, but they put all the equipment or cargo in the middle just because structurally, I guess it's, it works out better. So yeah, like and you're facing, balance yeah, or whatever. Right. And you're facing out the back of the plane. So we're facing out the back of the plane. Uh, we get on, you, one of the engines going, but the wings are up and then he puts down the wings. And then there's a, there's a, a flight crew guy who's putting you in like a five point harness <laughs> and he's like grabbing any equipment that's not like attached to you. He's like, Hey, I'm going to put this in the middle of the plane. You're like, okay, you know, that's cool. Whatever. <laughs> and we're looking at each other and going, dude, what's up with these harnesses, man. And so then you feel the plane get into position and the other engine come on. And then you feel like the and you hear the noises of like the cable getting attached to the plane. And then the flight engineer jumps in his seat real fast, puts his harness on and he puts his head down and like shrugs his shoulders. And I look at my partner, I'm like, what's he? And I didn't even get it out of my mouth. The catapult hit the plane and our arms and legs go flying. And this thing goes from like zero to 160 <laughs> something miles an hour in like three or four seconds, dude, to like launch us off this aircraft carrier. It was insane, dude. <laughs>